morning everyone. Our first hymn will be song number 384, Safely Through Another Week.
this time we'll continue with some choruses and we started i'm gonna sing 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 i'm gonna shout 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 <laughs> to seek and save the lost. Luke 19 and verse 10. Good morning boys and girls and happy Sabbath to you. Our story is entitled, Too Short to See. Do you know someone that other people don't like? Do you think Jesus likes that person? What would you do if you knew no one liked you? People didn't like Zacchaeus. Why didn't people like Zacchaeus? Because Zacchaeus was a tax collector. And people didn't like tax collectors because they thought tax collectors cheated. Zacchaeus heard that Jesus loved everybody. I wonder if Jesus loves me, he thought to himself. No, Jesus can't love me. Even people don't like me. Did Jesus love Zacchaeus? Of course he did because Jesus loves everybody. Zacchaeus wanted to be like Jesus, but the people still didn't like Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was sad and discouraged even though his heart had changed, no one believed him. But Jesus would understand. One day Zacchaeus heard that Jesus was coming to Jericho. That was his town. Oh, he had to see Jesus. Zacchaeus walked into the crowd and crowded streets. He was a short man, so he couldn't see over the tops of people's head. He was going to miss seeing Jesus. He turned quickly and climbed up into a nearby sycamore tree. Then he saw Jesus coming. Suddenly, Jesus stopped right under that tree. 
he looked up at Zacchaeus and said, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down. I must stay at your house today. The people were so surprised. They couldn't believe that Jesus would want to go to the house of a tax collector. Zacchaeus quickly climbed down out of the tree and took Jesus home with him. Now he knew that he was forgiven. He knew that Jesus loved him. Jesus told everyone in Zacchaeus' house that he had come to save everyone, including them. Zacchaeus wanted to do things the way Jesus did. He looked at Jesus and said, I want to give half of my money to the poor, to the people I may have cheated. I want to give back four times as much as I took. I want to love everybody the way you do. Jesus was happy that Zacchaeus felt that he was part of God's family. Jesus wants us to feel a part of God's family too. Jesus wants everyone to be in his family. Remember boys and girls, Jesus came to seek and save the lost. Luke 19 and verse 10. Bye and have a wonderful Sabbath. Good morning boys and girls and happy Sabbath to you. How are you this Sabbath morning? I hope you're all well. Have you all studied a lesson this week? No, we have. We can't make any excuses. Remember, we're home, so you can't say you forget your book home. You're home, so you're supposed to take out your quarter. Let's take out our quarter and go into a lesson and understand that God wins. But the monthly theme of this lesson is God's grace is good news for us. So the whole month of February, we have to remember our monthly theme is God's grace is good news for us. And that means all of us. What is our message? Our message is God gives me the victory. Who gives the victory? God gives the victory. And we're going to see how he gives the victory. Let us look at our memory verse. It's taken from 1 Samuel 14.6. 1 Samuel 14.6. I guess everybody have the quote list by now. Let's go. 3, 4. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving. One more time. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving. What does that mean? Well, let us see in our lesson. How nothing can hinder. Our lesson is based on Jonathan and his armor bearer and how God used them to win the victory. King Saul's army was camped under a tree near Gibeah. The Philistines were camped nearby in a narrow passage in the mountain. Every day, these Philistines would send out soldiers to harm the Israelites and steal from them. The Philistines had hundreds of chariots. As a matter of fact, that. 3,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen and they were well armed. How much people think it had in the Israelite army? 600. Yes, they heard me correctly. 600. So all together, the Philistines had 36,000 and all the Israelites had was 600. Do you think you could win a war with that? Impossible. But let us see what happened. None of the Israelites who they had Saul was spear. As a matter of fact, only Saul and Jonathan had spears and, and swords. The Israelite army had, guess what? Plow, hoe, axe, and sickle for weapons. Now, those are farming implements. You can't go and fight people on horseback with farming implements. You'll lose already. And, of course, they were scared. What happened? No. When they saw the Philistine army, they hid in the rocks and they hid in caves because they were scared. Only Jonathan was brave enough. You know why? Because Jonathan loved the Lord and Jonathan did what the Lord said. So, only he alone taught that God could win the battle. One day, Jonathan whispered to, his, to the soldier who carried his heavy shield. We will call him his armor bearer. He said, come with me. The armor bearer knew at once that Jonathan had a secret plan. He quickly dressed and followed Jonathan out of the camp. Nobody heard them leaving. They left quietly. The 
because they might just try to discourage them. So they went. And here what Jonathan said, we can get to the Philistines and look out if we take the passage between the mountain, Jonathan explained, God will give us, God will get us past the guards and give us the victory. Nothing can stop God from saving us. Remember the message? God give me the victory. That was Jonathan's belief. The armor bearer said, Okay, Jonathan, you lead the way. I'm right behind you. Let's go, Jonathan said, starting towards the narrow path. If when you see us, if when they see us, they tell us to wait for them to come down, we will wait. But if they say, come up to us, we will know. That is the sign that God gave us the victory. So after a slow hard hike, Jonathan and his armor bearer reached the pass. Boldly, they stepped forward in full view of the Philistines' guard. Look, one of the guards cried out, the Israelites have crawled out of their holes. Come up. So we can teach you a lesson, another shouted. That's our sign said, you understand? God has given them into our hands. So the two began climbing up the steep cliff. When they got to the top, Jonathan walked forward. His armor bearer was right behind him. Twenty Philistine guards suddenly attacked in just a small space. But Jonathan and his armor bearer, they knew fully well that God will help them. The Philistines, the 20 Philistines, were quickly defeated. Other guards watching from the top of the cliff panic and become confused. When they saw what was happening, they shouted down to tell the soldiers in the Philistine camp. And these soldiers panicked. Even the chariot driver panicked. In the confusion, they, be they began to push and fight one another, killing one another. The ground shook as if a great army with horsemen and chariots were coming. Jonathan's armor bearer and the Philistines knew that God was helping Israel. When King Saul and his 600 soldiers came upon the scene, Jonathan's armor bearer stood quietly watching the Philistines run away. The soldiers of Israel knew that they had won because God had the battle won for them. This day, the Lord has rescued us, they said. Jonathan and his armor bearers agreed. The Lord has won a great victory. Nothing had stopped God from saving them. That is our lesson. Do we understand that? Do you understand what went on there? What went on there is Jonathan and his armor bearers, they were not scared. They knew, they prayed that God would give them the victory. And they did get the victory because they obeyed. So I'm saying, whatever is your challenge, whatever it may be, whether it's in school, at home, whatever, just remember one thing. God will always give you all the victory. Thank you and have a pleasant Sabbath. Happy Sabbath, juniors. Welcome to our lesson study for today, which is entitled, Crumbs for the Dogs? Jesus needed a quiet place to have his final training with the disciples before they were to go out to preach on their own. He would not have the peace and quiet that he needed anywhere in Galilee because everyone there had heard of his healings and his preaching. Multitudes of thousands followed him everywhere he went. So he and the disciples traveled to Phoenicia where few had heard of him. No sooner than they began walking down the main street in Sidon, however, they heard the voice of a woman calling, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is possessed of a terrible demon. Jesus continued to walk along the road as if he had not heard her. But she repeated her plea as her voice drew nearer and nearer. The disciples encouraged Jesus to chase the woman away, but he already knew that she needed his help and that this was a good way to teach the disciples an important lesson. The Greek woman soon caught up to them and threw herself at Jesus' feet, pleading, Help me, Lord! Now the disciples knew by the way she spoke that she was not a Jew. She did not worship the God of heaven and therefore was not a child of God. Most Jews at that time considered anyone who was not a Jew to be a heathen and treated them only slightly better than dogs. Jesus decided to use this opportunity to show that this was not the right way to think of others. But testing the woman further, Jesus answered her, Let the children be filled first, for it is not good to give the children's bread to little dogs. By this he meant, 
Like many Jews believed at that time, that the blessings of God were for firstly God's children. The determined woman answered, Yes, Lord, but even the dogs eat from the crumbs of the children. By this she meant that even those who were not God's children would be blessed by the overflow from the blessings he sends his children. God told her then, or Jesus told her then, Go your way, the demon has left your daughter. Jesus wanted to show the disciples that God cares for everyone regardless of creed, race, or social status. We too need to learn the lesson that Jesus can save anyone from the power of sin, and we are to treat every human being as a deserving child of God. This ends our story for this week. Bye! Good morning boys and girls and welcome to today's mission story. Today's mission story is located in Kyrgyzstan in Central Asia and the name of today's story is called Surprise Gifts. Do you like surprise gifts? But before we go into the story, let's hear a little about Kyrgyzstan. The Kyrgyzstan Mission is part of the Southern Union Mission within the Euro-Asia Division. It has 11 churches and 12 companies and a membership of 664, with a population of 6,457,000. There is one Adventist for every 9,724 people. The Kyrgyzstan is a mainly mountainous country in Central Asia. It is watered by Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, and China. The Tayan Shan, or the Mountains of Heaven, is a mountainous range in Central Asia, consisting of a series of mountainous ranges. 80% of Kyrgyzstan lies within the Tayan Shan. Two and its two highest peaks are found on Kyrgyzstan's borders. Senior-old Jared heard about a boy named Wilford from Uncle Arthur's bedtime stories. Now Jared loved hearing about Wilford because Wilford used to surprise people with gifts. He would wrap the gifts up, tie them to a rope, and lower them over people's walls, then fled. Now Jared loved the idea and decided he will do the same in Kyrgyzstan where he lived his parents and older brother Sam. So he went along to ask his mother if he can try it. Can we put some of these in the old boxes? Well, what kind of gifts? Like toys and anything else I could find. Mother liked the idea. Jared and Sam had cars and Legos they had brought from Argentina to serve as gospel workers. Many neighborhood boys were poor and didn't have toys. The boys took two boxes and filled them with Legos, toy cars, scarves, and bars of soap. Getting onto their bicycles, they rode to Camille's neighborhood and chose two houses at random. Jared hurled one box over a fence, and Camille threw another one over another fence. Quickly, the boys pedaled away. At Jared's house, they laughed as they imagined the surprise of the children who had received the gifts. The boys, Jared's older brother, and their school friend filled two plastic bags with a variety of toys, scarves, and soaps yet again, and load loaded the boxes on their bicycles. They set off in search to find unsuspecting homes. Throw your box into the grass. Quick, quick, let me do something. Come on, let's go, let's go before anyone sees us. The boys raced away on their bicycles after throwing four more gifts over the fences. The boys were left with one last box. Jared spotted a house with a large gate.
Why are you putting garbage in my yard? During family worship that evening, Jared and Sam excitedly told father and mother about what had happened, and they were pleased. They prayed for the people who had received gifts. Jared and Sam are still throwing surprise boxes over people's fences. No one knows they are responsible, and that's the way they want it. offering three years ago helps construct a gymnasium at Jared and Sam's school in Tama, Kigaston. Thank you for supporting Adventist Education. So kids, what can you do to help other people? Remember, Jesus said it is more blessed to give than receive in Acts 20, 35. Enjoy the rest of your Sabbath. Goodbye. Happy Sabbath, boys and girls. It is often said that prayer is talking to God as to a friend. However, with our friends, we sometimes can talk for hours on end. But when we pray, it is sometimes difficult to know what to say. Our activity this morning could help us find it easier to talk to Jesus. We will be making a prayer jar. We will need a jar. Now you can use any size that you wish. You can even cut a water bottle and use that as your jar. You will need stuff to decorate that jar. I am using this morning some cut out flowers. Um, your heart with the words prayer jar written on it and I also have a string to tie around with the jar. You will also need some palette sticks and we are going to use these sticks to write our prayer request on. You will need some paper to decorate the palette sticks as you will see later on. A pen and of course scissors and glue. Okay, first we need to decorate this jar. With our pre-cut heart, with our words prayer jar written on it, again you can decorate your heart as you wish. We would have punched a hole through which we will be sending our string. We will now take the string and tie it around our jar. And we can make a bow to the front. If you have difficulty making your bow again, you could always ask an adult. Pray jar. Then we will continue to decorate our jar. As I said earlier on, you can use whatever you desire to decorate your jar. However, this morning we will just be using four pre cut flowers. Put my glue on. I'm going to stick it on. Sometimes we have to wait a while for that glue to dry, depending on the glue you are using. That's our jar. So while our jar is drying, we can now do our palette sticks. Now, on our palette sticks, we are going to write our prayer request. Now, you can list any number of things that you would like to pray for. So you take your pen, black and preferably, and you can write what you would like to pray for. Let's see, we can, write, we can pray for someone who is sick. I said you can make as many as you wish now from our gift paper or whether we have cut on the tape we can cut a piece from it this time it might be easier to use some stick glue and we can put the glue on and just decorate the end of the stick like this okay and then you put it into your jar these are some of the things for which you can pray 
I have here listed. You can pray for your brothers and sisters, things that you are thankful for, your friends, your teachers, your parents, and you can go on and on with your list. So boys and girls, with this collection, you know exactly what you can talk to Jesus about. Remember, you can always add, and Jesus will be happy to hear from you every day. Until next time. Is it amazing how these seeds can turn into this? Or how this little plant can turn into this big tree. Take this mango tree as an example. For now, it doesn't have any fruits. But if you add a little water and some sunlight in mango season, you'll have many mangoes to enjoy. One of my favorite Psalms is Psalms 1. It speaks about the blessings a person could receive when they read the word of God. Psalms 1 verse 3. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth fruit in his season. His leaf shall also not wither and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. We as Christians are like the seed and God is like the farmer. He takes us and plants us. Just like the seed, we need to be planted in the right soil. We need to be watered by the Holy Spirit. We need to receive light from the Son of God. And in due time, we will grow into trees that bear fruit. We can be a blessing to others around us. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Thank you for everything you have done. Please help us to know that if you plant us and water us, we will grow and to be strong trees and bear fruit, Jesus. Please help us to enjoy the rest of the service and please help us to have a wonderful time today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you tried to describe what God is like, it could be difficult or daunting. But when the people who wrote the Bible pondered the mystery of God, they consistently described God's character in this way, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, overflowing with loyal love and faithfulness. The very first word used in this description of God is compassionate, or in Hebrew, rachum. This word also appears as a noun, rachamim, or compassion. And what's fascinating is that both of these words are related to the Hebrew word for womb, rechem. So compassion in the Hebrew Bible is centered on a person's core, and the word invites us to imagine a mother's tender feelings for her vulnerable infant. So rahum is a word that conveys intense emotion. Sometimes it's even translated as deeply moved, like in the story of King Solomon, who meets two women who've just given birth. One of their babies sadly dies, but then both women claim that the baby still living is theirs. As a test, Solomon says to cut the baby in two and give each mother a half. And the baby's real mother is deeply moved. She would rather the other woman take her baby than see her child die. And it's her compassion that reveals that she's the true mother. But rahum isn't just an emotional word. It also involves action. And surprisingly, the word is used most often to describe God's actions motivated by his emotions. Like when the Israelites are suffering and oppressed in Egypt, God hears their cries and is compelled by his compassion, his rachamim, to rescue them. Then, as the Israelites travel through the dangerous wilderness, they're hungry and thirsty. And God is rachum, caring for them as his own child. He provides everything they need, food, water, and clothing as he personally guides them. So it's no surprise that when Yahweh reveals his character to the Israelites in the wilderness, he begins by saying he's compassionate. But despite Yahweh's continual rachamim, the Israelites turn away from him time and again. They reject Yahweh's compassion and instead give their allegiance to other gods. And rather than showing compassion to each other, they do violence and their rebellion results in exile, and they're scattered among the nations. 
and it's in this dark moment in Israel's story that we come to the book of Isaiah, where Yahweh compares himself to a mother full of rachamim toward her baby. He says, can a mother forget her nursing child or have no compassion or rachamim on the child of her womb? Even if she forgets, I will not forget you. God is full of motherly compassion and he will rescue his people. And as you read further in Isaiah, you realize that God is going to do this by entering into the suffering of humanity. And this points forward to a time when Jesus comes on the scene. He is Yahweh's deep compassion become human. In Greek, the word compassion is oiktirmos. And as Jesus embraces the sick and cares for the outcast, he is deeply moved by human suffering. Jesus compares himself to a mother hen using her wings to shield her chicks from danger as he gathers people into his embrace. And in the ultimate expression of oiktirmos, Jesus is moved by compassion to enter into humanity's suffering, into death itself, to rescue and bring us near to God. And it's this same life of compassion that Jesus calls his followers to imitate, allowing ourselves to be moved by the pain of others, to embrace the hurting, and to participate in relieving suffering in the world. In this way, we too can embody the compassion of Yahweh, or in Jesus' words, be compassionate, just as your Father is compassionate. Now you can see how fitting it is that compassionate is the first word God uses to describe himself. So when we're in pain or see others suffering, we can be certain that God is deeply moved to respond and that he's there to meet us with his deep compassion.